good. Thanks for the kind introduction. And um, yeah, thank you also everyone for joining in this afternoon. I hope I can uh, give you some insights from the perspective of uh, kinetics and charge carrier dynamics that can guide uh, future design of um, solar sort of fuel production. And the motivation for this uh, research is, of course, our pressing challenge to reduce CO2 emissions that have already surpassed uh, the 400 ppm level in 2017 and um, have also caused this one degree of um, post-industrial um, warming. So in order to limit it ideally to uh, lower than 1.5 degrees, uh, we need to really um, get going in, in getting out the technologies needed to do this. And the IPCE uh, report suggests some of them that I just want to highlight as well for everyone to already adapt um, to mitigate climate change. And one of them would be, for example, now winter's coming to insulate housing and maybe also put on a layer or two more to lower the temperature of space heating. Um, using mass transit, like trains, for example, rather than flying. Um, and what this year's pandemic maybe has uh, done quite well is reducing business travel and inducing these nice video conferences that I do hope will continue also after this year. Um, a rather debated um, topic, probably reducing meat and dairy consumption. It's not always easy to adapt habits, but um, I wanted to highlight the science paper here by Poor and Nemechek um, that do list quite a lot of food uh, and their um, land, water and um, CO2 footprint. Um, but at the core, I think, of such a transition towards um, a low, a sustainable and low uh, CO2 emission economy is the transition towards a uh, circular economy and uh, not only towards a reuse and refurbish recycle, but also towards really using renewables um, for material synthesis and also renewable energy to, to make all the goods we need. And um, I think we all know that it is difficult to deploy such a large scale economy. And at the core, I think what we are currently missing is, um, is a sustainable uh, and affordable storage solution of the uh, renewable electricity, for example, that we produce from photovoltaics. And so I think the sun is the most abundant uh, renewable uh, uh, energy source. And so solar energy conversion forms the core of my research uh, group and is also at, at the core of my heart as, um, as a real game changer in, in the next decade. So there are uh, different routes to solar fuels that can, if well deployed, be uh, affordable and they can uh, change the transport sector, for example, uh, offer, offering clean fuels uh, for cars, uh, the maritime sector and maybe aviation as well. Uh, but also change key industries like the chemical industry, for example, by deploying green um, hydrogen, for example, or other green fuels that are C2 neutral at least. And um, one approach would be to couple photovoltaics uh, with electrocatalysis in photovoltaics. I'm not sure if students are listening, but I just wanted to highlight that in photo photovoltaics, you just deal with um, one task. So you, you absorb light and you want, it, uh, you want to get electricity out of it. So you want to separate the charges um, as efficiently as, as you can and harvest as much light as you can to then uh, generate as much current as you can get. Um, and then in electrocatalysis, you use this electricity to use uh, to uh, generate fuels like, for example, hydrogen. And this this com uh, common um, appro combined approach is already deployed in Europe. And for example, Australia and Japan are also investing in, in the a green hydrogen approach quite heavily. Uh, but a nicer and more direct approach would be uh, the direct photocatalysis. So combining the energy harvesting in a, in a photovoltaic with the catalysis um, all in one device, which, which sounds kind of elegant and direct and nice, but it is actually quite challenging. And uh, here I think I will go into a few details on the challenges in my talk. So in general, these approaches do have the same 
um, starting point. So, so you, we use in both approaches photo absorbers and also in the photo electrochemical or photocatalytic um, approaches, we ideally want to harvest all of the solar spectrum. So we do not limit ourselves to UV absorbers, but want to have like a, um, um, small band gap absorbers as well. And the combination of, of both uh, can give us in both examples, the photocathode, photo anode, so the pure um, photoelectrochemical or photocatalytic device, or the PV and electrolyzer um, device could yield around 30, uh, 25 to 30% uh, efficiency, which has been calculated just based on the band gaps used. However, in, in reality, uh, only a few devices have demonstrated these efficiencies, and most of them are actually photovoltaic electrolysis devices, and um, direct photocatalysis devices are rather around 1% or even less, uh, some of them but yeah, one to five percent, I think, is, is quite common, um, and only a few examples exist of uh, having direct approaches that that do deliver ten to nineteen percent efficiencies. But they use monolithic uh, and and uh, expensive materials like gallium arsenide, for example, three five absorbers. So I I wanted to go through the requirements of photocatalysts. Um, to kind of see where the bottleneck lies and what we need to focus on in the future to develop uh, better materials and at, at higher pace to have a steep learning curve um, to tackle this, this challenge in, in this decade, hopefully. So thermodynamically, if we take the simplest, um, I mean simplest in a way, simplest reaction uh, of splitting water into hydrogen and oxygen, already this reaction requires 1.62.2 Volt. So it's thermodynamically 1.23, but each catalyst um, has some over potential requirement, which is specifically high for the oxygen evolution reaction around 0.4 uh, volts. And this is a, a significant energy input that we require. So this energy input um, translates to a photo voltage that we would need from the photo absorber. But as I just said, we also want to harvest as much light as possible. Uh, from the visible light um, spectrum. So we, we then need to find two materials that provide this photovoltage uh, combined and are both chemically robust, so they don't show any corrosion and ideally consist of earth abundant materials that we can scale up to our global energy demands. So already this is quite, quite a, uh, th these are quite a few criteria uh, that materials have to meet for photocatalysis. Um, and on top of that, I would like to outline here three studies uh, and show that on, on top of the thermodynamic and material criteria, we also have kinetic criteria uh, on the photo absorbers themselves and the catalysts uh, involved. And so I will start off with a small polar information and hematite, um, then go, which is a typical photo absorbent photoelectrochemical cells then uh, talk about mobilities and kappa indium gallium selenide which is um, an emerging thin film photovoltaic uh, material and uh, and then discuss a novel photocatalyst uh, the lanthanum rhodium strontium titanate and the, the sheet that i also just highlighted and see what conclusions we can draw from these studies so hematite um, is, is used uh, since yeah since the 80s already uh, as a water oxidation photocatalyst. Uh, so it's that there are a few standard materials used in photoelectrochemical water splitting. And as you can see, um, we want to have them uh, kind of small band gap and aligned with the energy levels of water uh, reduction or CO2 reduction, for example, if we want to make different reactions and water oxidation. And uh, because gallium arsenide, for example, is quite expensive, uh, the community has long shifted towards uh, oxide materials that are uh, also earth abundant and um, robust. So especially hematite is um, highly stable against corrosion in alkaline media and have a quite uh, good band gap of two to uh, yeah, around two UV, better 1.6, but even with two UV we could get 18% uh, efficiency 
so I started off with this material also during my PhD in the group of Michael Gretzel and thought, OK, um, great material. I think we can engineer around it. The only downside that it has is the short hole diffusion length. So we should probably avoid the whole bulk of a photo absorber and just engineer such that we can completely um, neglect carrier diffusion and have a completely um, drift based system. So we, where we where the holes would drift towards the surface and do the reaction. And so I started off with um, atomic layer deposition of very thin film hematite films, uh, which has the advantage that you, you could co coat any nanostructured material with a high surface area and produce the same material on a highly nanostructured device, which is in this case even crystalline at low temperature, and even uh, and also do some model studies on a on a thin film flat electrode, and so uh, carrying out these these studies on on the flat films, you, you can see them here on the right. I could really tune. Uh, the thicknesses from 4 to 20 nanometer quite precisely with ALD and uh, no surprise I mean you, you can see this this current leveling off although the absorption of these films uh, is increasing quite linearly as you see here and the the reason for it is exactly the short, short hole diffusion length because the current is plateauing at uh, thicker in thicker films because the space such layer is also plateauing so we are only depleting part of the film and not further into the whole layer after a certain thickness but what was quite surprising to me is even in an ideal uh, case scenario where you have the entire film depleted uh, it, at this for example 10 nanometer thickness here you only reach 30 less than 30 percent of the uh, internal quantum efficiency so even if you account for all the absorption, you, you still do not um, convert all your generated charges to, to your product or to your current density in this case. And so then I joined James's group here at Imperial and wanted to analyze um, why this would be the case. And we used to, well, he's very specialized in transient absorption spectroscopy, which um, basically takes screenshots of uh, ground state absorption and then excited state absorption after a pump pulse and then compares the two and uh, at certain time delays and and monitors the lifetime of this excited state and when it decays. And so what we then uh, studied was uh, on, on these thin film hematite films exactly this transient absorption uh, kinetic trace here for example that you see which uh, shows the uh, the this, uh, differential tra um, transient absorption or here transmission uh, versus time and here you can see it's it's a picosecond time delay and one first observation in, in almost all the hematite samples is that after after a picosecond you already have lost uh, one third of your or about one third of your signal and to understand where this loss comes from uh, Artem Bakulian's group and Ernest Pastor in, in his group uh, designed a pump push for the current technique where similarly to the transit absorption technique you also excite the hematite um, with a visible pump pulse and monitor the photocurrent it generates and then um, compare that to the same experiment but then uh, a delayed infrared basically heat pulse like a, a push pulse that we um, that we time to this pump pulse and and then uh, monitor this transient photocurrent. And so what we have observed is with the same time constant we can observe uh, more photocurrent when we push with this uh, infrared pulse after after the pump pulse. And with some modeling of uh, the group of Aaron Walsh and, and his, um, his his postdoc we could then model that this uh, this loss and this this photocurrent gain that, that we have is due to polar information, which happens on the order of uh, 600 femtoseconds and hematite, so very fast. So in in the beginning, you you would uh, create this this rather this bend state, and then 
after less than a picosecond, this charge localizes on the latter side and then is very stable actually in hematite and it needs a certain um, activation energy to then get out of this polaron state and then uh, transition from uh, this polaron to the band state and then probably gets uh, uh, trapped or localized on the next uh, ionic letter site again. So this um, polaron transport is quite common uh, in oxide materials and limits their mobility to less than one centimeter square per volt second. And uh, ju just because it is activation energy dependent, so this kind of a hopping mechanism. And what was surprising was that it is even in the space charge layer the case. So typical measurements were uh, performed before on um, single crystals or without any applied uh, voltage. But here we, we really depleted the film as well and it still saw this fast trapping behavior, which explains this um, uh, the, the loss we have on longer timescales then. Because then once we have a localized charge, it is much more prone to, to recombination than a very delocalized bent state as in, in good semiconductors. And these good semiconductors are used in photovoltaics. And uh, I wanted to show an example of mobilities in copper indium gallium and selenide to really contrast this change or this difference in, in, in properties. And so we started off uh, with um, my uh, PhD student and, and James PhD student, uh, Yuhan Chang, and uh, worked on high efficiency CEIGS uh, solar cells provided by the group of Chivari at EMPA. And as you see, they, they give efficiencies of around 19% and have uh, a typical structure where the, a thick micron, I mean, three, almost three micron thick uh, CIGS layer is deposited on a moly substrate and then coated with some um, N-type layers and, and some window layers on top. And here the, the morphology shows that it consists mostly of large grains, but uh, in the beginning when you start to grow the CIGS on the moly substrate, it's quite tricky to grow the, uh, uh, the large grain directly. And so often smaller grains are um, found at the interface. And what we found very interesting in these samples um, is this band gap engineering approach where you have a band gap gradient across the film. So you have, um, if, you, if you have this moly substrate, you can actually see um, the moly substrate um, on the right here would be basically on the right hand side here. And then you would have a higher band gap gradient, which is buried with a gallium content, so the higher the gallium content, the higher the conduction band, so the valence band stays unaffected. And then they engineer an uh, energy notch um, closer towards the end and type contact here. And what we then uh, did with Yuhan, we excited uh, these samples with different um, wavelengths, so uh, varying the wavelength from 600, the pump pulse 600, towards 1000 nanometer. And this gave us insight into different regions of the film. So, for example, you can see that 600 nanometer light is absorbed rather at the surface that we so we peeled off the moly site. So this is kind of the exposed surface, while a, a thousand nanometer is absorbed uh, rather in the energy notch. And um, we could show that a simple kinetic model could uh, could explain our observations, and uh, we also uh, like tested it versus a drift diffusion model and came to the same same outcome. So in this simple kinetic model, uh, exciting, for example, with 600 nanometer, uh, 900 nanometer on the 1000 nanometer, we could extract different time constants. So one for recombination in these small grains and then recombination in the larger grain uh, in, in this band gap gradient area a combination in the notch and also a drift diffusion constant here. And um, these are the spectra. So for example, in the energy notch, we see the excited state absorption is, is, uh, is quite long lived. So the lifetime of, of, this, of these carriers is around 19 nanoseconds. 
then if we excite the smaller uh, grain uh, area of volume, we end up with only 100 uh, picosecond lifetimes. And if we um, excite this region here where the band gap gradient plays a huge role in the large grains, we can see that in, in the beginning, we have excited state absorption uh, from the, the volume that we excite, um, which then decays, but also transfers to a different region, which is corresponding to the energy notch here. And this decays again, not as, as fast as, uh, as the initial absorption. So from decoupling basically the kinetics of, of these, this bleach here at 930 nanometer roughly, and uh, the, the rise of this um, 1025 nanometer signal, we could, uh, we could obtain the diff diffusion constant of 1.9 nanoseconds and the charge carry combination constant of 2.8 nanoseconds. And what we found is uh, that this corresponds to a mobility of 30 centimeter square per volt second. And it's really important to see the kinetic competition. It's important to realize in these food absorbers because having a time constant of 100 picosecond in these small grains, we did not see any contribution to the uh, to, to carry us uh, di drift diffusing to the energy notch. So it is important to engineer good materials with um, with long lifetimes to then also have them uh, enable good charge transport and also do some uh, reactions in photocatalysts. So in um, in the next example, I think it is clear that we, we do need new materials because copper indium gallium selenide might not be the most stable one. So we need to think about uh, stability in uh, electrolyte environments. And so um, the general approach now would be to take stable materials like strontium titanate, for example, and then um, try to induce visible light absorption. And this approach has been um, nicely demonstrated by the group of Doman in, in Japan, and they achieved an efficiency of 1%, which is actually um, quite high for these devices. It's as efficient as photo, um, photosynthesis in, in plants. However, compared to, of course, PV electrolysis, uh, there's still a long way to go. Uh, the advantage of these systems is that um, they are quite easily um, fabricated and do not need uh, any, let's say, conductive um, substrates like FTO in, in, in the typical photoelectrochemical devices. So what they do is they just uh, drop cast the, um, the mixed particles evaporate some gold on top and then basically peel it off and have these sheet devices um, of those. So these are, um, th this is a, a, a very nice approach to, to, um, to see how band gap engineering also in, in the novel for the catalyst could be a very good pathway to, to go. So starting off with strontium titanate uh, which has a band gap of 3.2 eV, it's white, white powder. We want to expand the visible light absorption um, and then, for example, introducing the rhodium co-dopant, we can see that we obtain this purple powder and, um, and then further reducing this purple powder gives us a very dark yellow powder. And the same effect we also see when we co-dope this rhodium dope strontium titanate with lanthanum. So what we wanted to understand in this study is what, why is this material so special and why does it work better than, um, than other for, uh, partic particulate catalysts before. And so what we uh, saw here, the rhodium actually functions as a dopant that really affect the band gap of the material. And so from the XPS measurements and also the EFT calculations, we see um, there is a, there's a quite significant uh, interaction with the uh, valence band of the strontium titanate host lattice. And so, so strong that, uh, well, you can see it more here in the red, red uh, colored D states, so strong that, that the whole 
valence band edge shifts uh, towards um, towards higher binding energies here or here to, towards basically a narrow band gap. So this is quite important to, to realize that you need this interaction between uh, the, the valence band orbitals of the host lattice and the d orbitals uh, of your dopant. And furthermore, we could also see with the FT calculations that when we have the rhodium doped strontium titanate alone, we have the 4D5 state, which introduces this uh, mid gap states in, in the, inside the, the band gap, which can function as a recombination center. While as in the lanthan rhodium doped strontium titanate and also in the reduced uh, rhodium strontium titanate, the hydrogen reduced one, uh, we have actually a 4D6 um, state. And, and these do occupy so all three uh, levels are isoenergetic and no mid gap state is observed um, from DFT calculations. This is a quite important implication for uh, photocatalysis. And what we saw when we fabricated these um, photocatalyst sheets, just, just consisting of rhodium strontium titanate um, or lastum rhodium strontium titanate on gold, we could see that the rhodium strontium titanate had a potential dependent electron accumulation. So here this, this photo induced absorption signal grows when we change the voltage um, closer to the conduction band of the uh, rhodium strontium titanate, while as in the co-doped material, actually a, a voltage um, variation does not affect the electron accumulation too much. So we did a few more experiments and what we found uh, combining all the data together was that in lanthanum rhodium strontium titanate, you have quite a, first of all, quite a deep um, valence band of a P-type semiconductor. So the semiconductor is, is P-type with a Fermi level close to the valence band. And so naturally, uh, you, you would have a very uh, high extent of band bending that helps charge uh, separation. So um, electrons would rather uh, go, go towards the surface naturally. However, in the uh, rhodium strontium titanate, you have this potential dependent um, uh, electron accumulation because the potential does vary the material actually. So with um, the Fermi level below this empty uh, state that we have seen in the, in the, in the mid band gap, um, we, well, we have this rhodium four plus, but if we force the potential kind of surpassing this redox uh, state here, we end up with rhodium three plus uh, at the surface. And this gives us um, a better chance to, to have our um, photovoltage. And so for, the, for a particulate device, we have um, quite severe implications of such thinking. So in our redox um, active uh, rhodium strontium titanate material, it would also mean that we would work in, in a full device with a bismuth vanadate um, uh, anodic material, basically, at the lower for the current cross, uh, cross, cross overlap. While as um, in the lanthanum and rhodium strontium titanate material, we developed a full photovoltage and hence can achieve higher uh, photocurrents or let's say better catalysis in, in the photocatalyst sheet device because uh, it provides uh, more energy to, to the system. And so here, I think I, I already come to my conclusions. Um, so we, I think the, the study on hematite uh, and the polaron transport uh, in contrast to the study on the CIGS solar cells really shows that future photocatalyst materials um, uh, should should focus on the, the design of future photocatalyst materials should focus on semiconductor properties first. So um, in this diagram, I illustrate the time scales of different um, uh, different processes. So after absorption, we have the polaron formation really fast on subpico second time scales, then the trapping and trap states or and the subsequent recombination. And these processes occur 
way faster than the processes we want to happen, like charge extraction or uh, chemical reactions, especially the oxygen evolution reaction, which is here on, on timescales of uh, a second or more. So we, we um, want to avoid non-radiative recombination. And so I think novel uh, earth abundant, stable and luminescent materials um, are needed because if we have, if you observe photoluminescence, uh, like in the CIGS solar cells, we end up naturally with uh, longer um, re recombination lifetimes that are then in in good competition. They, they can outcompete. Um, I mean, the, the sorry, charge extraction can outcompete recombination then in these materials. Uh, then we have to engineer materials uh, with enhanced spatial charge separation. So, for example, really looking at the CIGS um, example, uh, band gap engineering could uh, be one way forward to to drive minority carriers away from from majority carriers and reduce recombination um, this way, as well as built in electric fields, design materials that uh, if they use a semiconductor liquid um, junction that provide a, a natural um, band gap grade, uh, sorry, electric field at the surface, just uh, to separate charge. And um, charge extraction layers are uh, one way forward as well, because um, they, um, first of all, you can inject in these charge selection layers quite fast, also on nanosecond time scale. And most of um, photovoltaics do utilize uh, charge extraction layers. Like this is an example on perovskite solar cells, where we had uh, with a correct charge extraction layer where we could inject well the tin oxide, we could achieve quite high efficiency materials. Well, if it's um, if we could not inject, then we suffered from recombination losses here and, and hysteresis approaches. So um, charge, uh, charge selective layers are a way forward to separate charges, but also to basically drive them out of the, of the photo system and then make the whole photocatalytic system still a dark uh, catalyst system. And, and so this would be another way to account for this mismatch in um, recombination versus reaction timescales. Uh, another pathway, I think that, that Magda Tedrici, for example, um, and I also pursue uh, value added oxidation. So replacing these reactions that are on, on very long timescales like the oxygen evolution reaction uh, with faster reactions that also need significantly less energy input. And uh, the last, I think, developing better catalysts on the surface, so whether it is the semiconductor itself or a co-catalyst that we can uh, adopt onto, onto the photocatalyst particle or electrodes, um, the development of faster and selective catalysts, of course, are, is important and single atom catalysis is a field that has been evolving for the past 10 years and I think is even more important in the next decade as well. So yeah, these are the next steps for uh, my group, the Atomic Scale Materials Design Lab, and uh, developing photo and electric catalysts with atomic layer deposition to try out new materials. And the work that I presented was mostly uh, from, yeah, was yeah, mostly from my uh, postdoc and uh, PhD time. And I would like to uh, to thank Benjamin, Ernest, and Johan, especially for working uh, on my team, and and James also uh, for the nice, um, yeah, nice time in the group. And my collaborators, uh, yeah, Katsunari Doman in Japan. Uh, Kian Wang, she's now with uh, Irvin Reisner uh, in, in Cambridge, and uh, my collaborators at EMPA, especially Roman Caron and uh, Roger Tiwari, and also my old uh, group and still collaborators as well, um, Matthew Meyer and Michael Retzel, as well as my Mary Curie funding. And thank you for your attention. Happy to answer any questions. Yes, uh, there's a question from Jisan, and she she's, well, thanks. She found my talk very interesting and asked about the polaron energy um, in hematite that looks rather large, the 0.5 uh, EV. 
and ask whether this is common for other oxide materials and what the origin of the polar information would be and why um, why the polarons localize, um, whether it's on defects or at grain boundaries. So in um, so first of all, yeah, the polar energy looks indeed very large and we were thinking as well whether uh, it is common. So people normally measure 300 milli electron volts, um, which is not too far from 0.5. So I think it is not um, un uncommon, let's say, to, to see the same order of magnitude of um, polar and binding energies. However, in, in hematite, and this comes also to the second question, uh, we also have quite a lot of defects and quite a lot of intrinsic defects, um, high carrier densities that are um, coupled to oxygen vacancies. So we can have the polaron trapping on, on, for example, if it's an electron polaron on an iron side, but if this iron side is next to an oxygen vacancy, I think this, this would be a much deeper trapping, uh, trap, trap than just a, an iron side on a, on a normal lattice uh, next adjacent to, to an oxygen um, site. So because hematite um, has quite high carrier concentrations on the order of 10 to the 19, sometimes 10 to the 20, um, I think I calculated the surface, surface um, carrier concentration and it was very close to the concentration of um, iron sites. So there are, there are quite, um, there are actually almost all sites at the surface would, would be uh, related to some defect sites. And it is very likely that, that these defect sites are also oxygen vacancies. So it, it might be the origin of this very um, large binding energy in hematite that it's not just a a usual polaron, but actually a polaron um, on an iron site that is adjacent to an oxygen vacancy, for example. Does this answer your question, Tisen? Thank you uh, very much, uh, Lyudmila, for, for your uh, great presentation. Oh, hang on before we, uh, before we go. Uh, yes, uh, Jason says thank you. Uh, <laughs> that does answer your question. <laughs> um, so great. Thank you very much again, Lyudmila, and thank